Imam Ahmad goes back to, to Baghdad, stays there for a couple of years, continues to teach. But again, the experience made him so frail. And in 855, at the age of 70, uh, 77, Imam Ahmad passed away. Uh, Al-Mutawakkil and the Abbasis, by way, I think, of apologizing. They felt so guilty. Uh, they wanted to turn Imam Ahmad's funeral into like a national event. They say that over 300,000 people attended the funeral of Imam Ahmed. That's a huge number, by the way, back then. To the extent that in, in the city of Baghdad, every corner, every street, every road, every avenue was filled with people standing in rows, praying janazah uh, on, 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 on the Imam when he passed away. Some narrations say it was all the way up to 850,000 people that attended his, his funeral. Uh, and, uh, and, and basically, people started, continued to come to Baghdad to pray janazah on Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal six or seven months after he passed away. They would still travel from other places. Once a year, that Imam Ahmed passed away, he would travel all the way to Baghdad just so, to pay their respects and, and pray janazah. And as I told you earlier, most of the scholars of Iraq at the time, when they came and, and, and attended his janazah, there was almost this universal agreement that after the Khulafa al Rashidin and Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, you know, the, 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 the just Umayyad Khalifa, uh, Ahmed ibn Hanbal basically comes next. And that's how the legacy of Imam Ahmed was, uh, was created. So I went a little bit over my time. I want to give you guys a chance to ask questions. We still have about 10 minutes. But that uh, technically concludes our lecture for tonight. Zakhwah Khaifer. Enduring uh, three hours of listening to this, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inspire each and every one of you with the great qualities and the life of this uh, incredible, incredible and inspirational scholar. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless each and every one of you for going out of your way uh, to learn the knowledge of the deen. And inshallah, we can take some questions if you have any. Well, the, the question is uh, the similarity between Ahmed and Abu Hanifa in the, in the sense that both they did not deliberately create a madhab, uh, unlike in many ways Shafi'i and Malik, in which you know their madhab were really solidified and crystallized in their lifetimes, and I think it's just. Historical factors, I think, contributed to that. Uh, you got to remember, Imam Ahmad and Imam uh, Abu Hanifa, they were, represent the, the, the two sides of the spectrum. Uh, so we have, you have someone who set out with, with, with a notion of activism, changing the corruption uh, in, in the Umayyad state, and using the resources of the deen to kind of achieve that. So fiqh was not the primary uh, 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 mission or goal of, uh, or objective of Imam Abu Hanifa, it came secondary. And, and I think that's why he was not interested necessarily in creating a method for himself. And I think Ahmed shares the same foundation of him. It wasn't really fiqh that drove him, it was the collection of the Prophet's hadith. And fiqh also came secondary uh, to that venture. And I think that is why both did not have a solid, clearly defined madhab in their lifetimes. But, but why Ahmed traveled all the way? Like I said, he, he wanted to preserve the words of the Prophet He wanted to to make available to his society the hadiths, so that people can derive fiqh, uh, not derive, so, so that people can know directly what the Prophet said about any given matter whatsoever, so they don't have to rely on ra'y or opinion or anything like that. Uh, uh, and, and so, People follow others because others have unique, sometimes contentious views of, and ideas about things, right? If, if, I, if, if everything I preach every day is, we have to pray five times a day, will I have any following? Will I have any following as a person? No, because I'm not, I, I'm not saying anything out of order. But when I start emphasizing certain things and other people start disagreeing with what I'm saying, that's when society has to make a choice. I'll either, I like this guy or I like that guy. And that's how opinions are created, are created and this is how following is created. 
So Imam Ahmed was not interested in, in any following, and that's why he limited his, his fiqhi opinions. He was interested in hadith, right? So at his time, you know, what would you say to a man who's just telling you the Prophet said this? You cannot agree or disagree with what he's saying. Uh, but later on with the work of his students, opinions have been have created or had been created and with the creation of opinion there will always be differences. And that's how a madhab is, is established. <coughs> yes? How many hadiths did he collect? Like I said, the Musnad had 30,000 plus. Uh, out of about 700,000 plus that he memorized. But he only included 30,000. Is, is it really... Is it really uh... 100% perfect, these... Uh, no, no, no. I, I, I said that there are, I'm not going to say many, but there are some weak hadith in the Muslim. And the scholars of hadith know that. And it's just, again, it's a compendium. So Ahmed was so keen that even if it's not 100% strong, it is better to keep it inside and have a scholar that will come after me verify it than completely lose it. Once and for all, right? It, it is better to keep it in there and then, you know, kind of dismiss it later, then to dismiss it now, and it turns out to be an actual hadith. So he was, he was kind of, you know, a, a bit conservative in that sense. Yes. What I have read about Ahmed bin Hanbal Malhab and what I learned tonight, it is completely different what I, I saw in Saudi Arabia when I went to Hajj, and they consider themselves uh, Hanbali. Hanbali. So, so I, I really think it's not a madhab question. This is this is a, a, an amalgam of, of socio-political, cultural, and historical factors that made Saudi what it is today. It has I don't think it has anything to do with the Hanbali madhab. I think Ibn Abdul Wahhab just happened. The founders of Wahhabism just happens to be a Hanbali. I don't think that, that was that was the issue with that. But but let me let me also just emphasize one thing, and I I, I needed to mention that in the course of the lecture. When you permit no opinion whatsoever in the shaping and devising of legal injunctions, inevitably the process will become quite rigid. Right? Because anybody who says, well, I think this hadith meant that, that will be dismissed right away. Well, we, we cannot admit, we cannot admit that. I'm sorry. I cannot listen to what you're saying. And the circumstances of life will change and society will evolve and there will be new problems and new challenges and, and new circumstances and new realities. And you need some rabbi to deal with that, right? So I think that contributed to the overall rigidity of the madhab that took place over centuries, obviously. But this is, again, this is my social science perspective. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows this. Yes? I was wondering, I'm wondering um, under like the torture and all that, in Islam, is that ever allowed to do is it ever allowed to do what? To admit something which is like, like the problem was created. Is, is there any? Of course, it is allowed. This is not a question of whether or not he was allowed Islamically to say something that he doesn't really believe in in order to protect himself and to preserve his life. That is definitely allowed. You know, some of the Sahaba, you know exactly what I'm talking about. They they had to confess the word of kufr to preserve themselves from torture. But Imam Ahmed, you know, he, he was above and beyond that. He thought, that I have a responsibility. If I said this stuff, the entire Ummah will be corrupted. And, you know, I, I don't care. Yes, it is halal for me to say whatever they ask me to say. That's probably why the others, other scholars did it. But hey, I'm the last man standing here. Allah did not put me in this position for no reason. I need to endure. They take my life, fine, take my life. But that will cause people to think about why I, I, I was killed. And, and that in and of itself might preserve orthodoxy as he understood. So, really, yeah. Followers of uh, Imam Muhammad. But his school of thought really is quite limited in terms of his influence in the Islamic world. It was a small area and the number Correct. of people. So what, what do you think is the reason for that? I, I, like I said, I answered this question you know, uh, in a, in a quasi-manner a few minutes ago. And I think that the needs of human society change and evolve every day. And there are always new challenges that are presented to us. And there are things that the Prophet ﷺ did not talk about. Right? By virtue of him living 1400 years ago. It's just, it was no possible way for him to issue a hadith about the space travel. Right? 
So society always needs a more lenient approach to legal injunctions, to fiqh. I need scholars who can take scripture and take hadith, process it a little bit, and not give me just a raw perspective on what the Prophet said. I need to say, to see how applicable that is to my particular problem right now. And I think that limited the reach of the Hanbali madhab over the centuries, because again, that was out of the question for them. As a matter of fact, the Hanbali madhab gave birth to another more stricter madhab, a Bahiri, man of Hazm. Uh, in, in Muslim Spain, and again, I, I say stricter, you know, liberally, that is probably inappropriate, uh, but it was, it was basically the emphasis on the direct <laughs> meaning of any hadith, no room for any processing, like, you cannot, like, look in between the lines or, or try to find the essence of just whatever it literally says, and so it was a, a, a stricter form of literalism from Hanbali, uh, from Hanbali fiqh, uh, and, and, and again, you know, the Bahiriya virtually disappeared, Hanbali Madhab is, is now confined, I think, to, uh, to the Gulf, to Saudi Arabia and the surrounding countries. So I really think that is the reason why. Uh, that in staying on toward your principles and dying for it is a victory, even though at that time you would think that it is not a victory. I mean, we see it, for example, in the story of Ashab al Hud, how they died because they wanted to believe. And somebody like Sayyid Qutb, for example, standing up for Abdul Nasser and, uh, and uh, not apologizing and his book became popular after he died you know and it's in everybody's house now but let me get to my question do you think that Imam Ahmed uh, thought about changing his mind regarding um, going against a tyrant uh, ruler based on the torture that he had because if he would have stood against him and said overthrow this guy maybe um, you know this would not have blasted and and uh, and uh, and <laughs> That's, that's a good question. Do you guys hear the question? Uh, again, Imam Ahmed was, uh, as you said, he was a man driven by, by principle. And he, would not, he was not the kind of man that would take advantage of, of a massive mistake that the Abbasis did in order to orchestrate uprising against him. Why? Because he did not believe in the permissibility of political uprising in the first place. So he cannot uphold orthodoxy, as he understood it, while violating it at the same time. Ends would not justify the means for him. He believed that Abbasis are in power and that's the right place and nobody should challenge it. I mean, you and I agree with that, but that was his theological position. At least he was honest to them and he was true to them. I'm not going to incite the masses to go against the Abbasis just to get myself off the hook because that would, get, that would go against my principles as well. So I am saying to the Abbasis, no, what you're saying is wrong, but I cannot ask people to go against them either because that also would be wrong. And he was, a, he was a principled man. And alhamdulillah that he was, because I, I really think it is precisely because of his principle that he was able to endure. Any other scholar would have found a way out of it. Any other scholar would have found a justification, an excuse to tell him whatever they wanted to tell him. It is that strictness when it comes to principle, I think, that, uh, that got him out of this fitna. And alhamdulillah, the ummah as well went to sleep. So. Any of the sisters would like to ask a question? Not tonight? Yes. Is it close up to the thinking? To be it was, it was, again, the brother is asking about to be as any in which way. Yeah. The brother is, is still intrigued, I think, by Mu'tazali theology and the creativeness of the Quran. And again, you know, I, I, I only have a social science explanation to that. You know, it was an empire that had reached the height of, of, of uh, political, military, and economic power. And, you know, people had enough money to spend time you know, going into these intellectual abstract ventures. They could have afforded, you know, America can afford to do that. I mean, you look at the stuff, they, they, they write their PhD dissertations about, just laughable stuff sometimes, right? Really abstract notions that will have very little impact on people's lives. And maybe 200 years from today, God knows, you know, academia has its way of evolving into something useful. But my point is, a given society could have not afforded to do that unless they had the luxury to do it, right? And I think that's what they did. And also keep in mind, there must have been some tolerance, some political tolerance for these differences of opinion. 
So, Abbasi uh, conformity, you know, forcing everyone to accept the Atizan was the exception, means that society in general tolerated these opposing views. SubhanAllah, I mean, I, I really think that that was incredible. Also, keep in mind, in, in the movement of translating Greek works, lots of Hellenistic ideas disseminated into the Muslim Empire, and Greek works and philosophy, rationalization and so forth. Uh, the uh, Mu'tazilis were the rationalists of their time. They rejected uh, anamorphism, they rejected uh, metaphors, they looked at the Qur'an, uh, I'm sorry, they rejected literalism, they looked at the Qur'an as all metaphors. You know, God is not really sitting on a throne, that's just a metaphor. You know, God doesn't have a hand, it's just a, it's just a metaphor, and so on and so forth. I really think that Mu'tazili thought is not dead. Every single one of us, I think, has a percentage, a degree of that is that in Every single one. Right? It's just, it was so stark, it was so conspicuous with the Mu'tazili as a group. They went too far. But we cannot in any way, shape, or form dismiss all of their theology because they, they contributed really some useful thoughts as well. There are some of the things they say that I cannot reject or dismiss. There is a bit of i'tizal, I think, in each and every one of us. It's just we have to decide, you know, how much, and, you know, keep it in its own rightful place. A little bit of rationalism is always a good thing. You know, total, total irrational state of mind is not good, but way too much rationalism, you know, turns the demon into some gags. And, and you don't want to do that. One last question? Yeah. Uh, is this true that uh, the Fiqh of uh, or the followers of uh, Imam Hamel have kind of uh, uh, disappeared after uh, uh, Imam Taymiyyah and, and all the, uh, after 12th century, uh, like uh, the followers of uh, Imam Azai and some other faqis who, who were popular at some period of time. But it was later in the 17th century, resurrected by the Saudis, uh, and, uh, and they actually are uh, not, in the opinion of some people, they are not really humblies, they are Ghair so they, they... Right. Is I, that true? Honestly, honestly, I don't know. I don't know. I did not follow uh, the historical evolution of, of the Hanbalis uh, post Ibn uh, if I have to guess, I would think that they became quieter, they did not disappear. Uh, but again, you know, I, I really don't know, I don't have enough knowledge about that particular aspect, so uh, I, 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 I should be able to do some further research to study the historical evolution of, of the Hanbali Madhab post Ibn Taymiyyah. Uh, but like I said, I, I don't have enough knowledge to answer that question. Yes? Can I ask that question, Duma, the biggest fan around Damascus? They are actually followers of the Hanbali Madhab, and they have nothing to do with Saudi Arabia. <laughs> Very interesting. Thanks, thanks for sharing this. Yes. I was going to say that I did like 50 years, more than 50 years, my life in Saudi Most of the things in Saudi Arabia came from the culture, not from Hanbali or any other deen. So the deen and culture are mixed together, and this is what the people have observed in Saudi Arabia. It's just it's not something like they are not representing the deen, or they are not representing the... Well, they claim that they do. Yeah, but they are not. The culture is coming and mixing, like a woman driving a car. It's just nothing to do with the deen. It's just the culture. You cannot, you cannot find a, a taqlid or hadith perspective that supports such thing. As a matter of fact, I think you need lots of luck to be able to come to, to that conclusion, which is uh, very interesting. But again, you know, I, I have, the brother says that he grew up in Saudi Arabia. I, I, when I was a kid, I lived in Saudi for, for six years with my parents. Uh, and you know, Saudi society is as diverse as any other society, right? Saudi people are really incredible and amazing people in Saudi Arabia. Extremely honest and sincere open-minded scholars, and there are others who are not. Uh, politics in Saudi Arabia manipulates uh, the religious establishment more often than not. Uh, but again, we should not fall in the mistake of generalization about any given society whatsoever. It's just as diverse. Everything just happens you know, under, under the rug, you know, in closed doors in Saudi Arabia, uh, unlike other countries. There's, there isn't that openness. But, but I agree with you that it is much of the stuff that we see over there is, is a product of, of, of a Bedouin culture uh, that is conservative by definition uh, and, 
and less inspired by, by religion, let alone the Hamdali Madhab. Um, but that's, that's a subject of another lecture or discussion. Zakallah khair, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless each and every one of you. Subhanakallah wa alhamdi, wa shayu wa la ilaha ila ant. Astaghfiru ka matubu ilayk. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa asr ima al-insana fi khusr. Ila al-Dhina amin wa amin al-Salihat wa dawasa bi-haq wa dawasa bi-sabr. Inshallah, we're going to go upstairs and pray. Assalamu alaykum.